Brewdog is now worth over 2 billion. James, why do you think Brewdog has such a bad rep? We had to let go six or seven people for cheating on their expenses. Oh my God. I broke down in tears in front of the team because I thought everyone was going to lose their jobs and the business was going to... Brewdog have come under scrutiny after a campaign promoting a pink beer for women. The CEO and founder James Watts has claimed that the campaign was intended to be satirical rather than offensive. People just saw pink IPA and they thought we were the thing that we were parodying. You have formally stepped back as CEO from Brewdog. I was undergoing some things personally that were like the toughest things that I'd ever underwent. I'm not going to tell the full story at some point when... When you're legally allowed to. No, I'm legally allowed to now, but I just... <laughs> Got all the time in the world, mate. Crack no. open a new Brewdog. <laughs> yeah, give us the short version. We definitely had a tough time in the media, I would say, over the last five years. James, what's your go-to hangover cure? So my go-to hangover cure is very, very specific. So so many of the effects of hangover is amplified by the dehydration that you get when you're drinking alcohol. So before I go to bed, I drink two pints of water laden with electrolytes and salts. It tastes horrible, but it just means you wake up the next morning like so much fresher. And I had my, like, a few of my best buddies from my fishing boat days were down in, Scot in uh, London with me a few weeks ago. And we had like a big night out. We were playing golf the next morning and I thought everyone was going to be hungover as hell. So we, when we got back to my apartment, I made the same cocktail for them. Next morning, everyone was on their A-game. So Can you tell us about it? Can oh. you tell us more? What's in there? How do we make it? Where do we get it? Yeah, so um, I've got a few that I use from various different companies. The company that I use at the moment is called Relight. So it's just a kind of mixture that you use that you put in your water. And it's got salts, it's got electrolytes, it's got minerals, but it essentially increases hydration in your body. So obviously you're still going to get some impacts of the hangover, but the most of the hangover is amplified by the dehydration. Hydration. So if you can take the dehydration out, you can manage the hangover. So really random thing, and I don't know if you know this or can validate it. And I've only ever done it once, <coughs> which is relevant, which is uh, when I went to Oktoberfest. I yep. went with the guy who's been going for 30 years yep. and he used to be a general in the army and all this kind of stuff. And he was our chairman in my last company. So his whole thing about... I'll be your chairman, but I've got to take you guys to Oktoberfest. And we we're like, that, that yes, sounds like yeah. an incredible deal. <laughs> yes. What a punishment. Yeah, done. So anyway, he took us to Oktoberfest. He told Did you us, have lederhosen on? Yes, 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 yes. And he made us do it all of it. All of it. He was like serious about the whole thing. Um, anyway, he told us to take an aspirin. And so we took an aspirin before we started drinking. And he said, mm -hmm. basically, it, st it, it, it relaxes your bladder. So one of the things that happens when you start drinking is you actually, from hydrate, dehydration, you urinate less during the night. And so mm -hmm. you... Uh, anyway, there's this whole whole shtick, and his thing was aspirin. That's the trick, and he was right. Weirdly, well, we before had, you drink, before you start drinking. So our formula currently is aspirin pre-drinking, mm. drink responsibly, and then so. uh, obviously take heights because I actually think heights is pretty anti-hangover. Yeah, vitals then, by the way. Yeah, get amazing. hold of um, get hold of what you're saying, and then you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, Glad we've established that. Yeah. What is the last book that changed your perspective on business? I read the Elon Musk autobiography by yeah. Walter Isaacson. And it was so weird because I usually like start a book and I finish it so, so quickly. It was oddly painful to read because with every page, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, I felt more and more inadequate. So it was like painful reading it because it's like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. I'm not mm. pushing that. I'm not working hard enough. I'm not ambitious enough. And like, I think relative to whoever, I am quite ambitious. But for me, it was a painful read and it was an inspiring read. But just to kind of read of like how passionate, how driven, how focused, how much attention goes on kind of trying to achieve something that was bigger in himself. So I just kind of doubled down on what I was trying to do. It gave me a kind of renewed sense of purpose, but I found it painful to read because I felt woefully inadequate mm. with every page I turned. Brewdog's obviously a global business now with, you know, billions of dollars of value and all of this kind of stuff. But how mm. close has it come to bankruptcy? Oh, so close, so many times. And I work with so many startup businesses at the moment as an investor and advisor. And what I always say to them, if you are not on a knife edge, constantly you're not pushing your limited capital hard enough if you're comfortable you need to push more and like for the first six years I was delighted when we had enough money to pay the staff at the end of each month and we was almost never able to pay ourselves but if we were sitting in cash I wanted that cash to be working I wanted that to be kind of pushing and kind of growing the business so we teetered on the like on the kind of precipice of oblivion for kind of six plus years but i think that's got to be the way because you've got a limited amount of resources you've got to work those hard so you've got to exist on that edge mm. what's your favorite non brew dog beer oh amazing question so i just love beer and i love sharing the passion i've got for fantastic beer and 
like discovered in as many beers as I can. So there's a beer business in San Diego called Alesmith. They make a beer called Speed, Speedway Stout. They do a Vietnamese coffee infused one that is absolutely insane. I love that beer. Again, from California, Russian River, do an IPA called Pliny the Elder. Absolutely mind blowing for an IPA. And then classic from Belgium, anything from Cantillon. Is there any super mainstream beer that you are willing to say I quite like? Um, and it's not that I've got anything in theory against saying that I like it. <laughs> if I did like it, I just I don't like them. And we exist to give some give people a better option. Okay, fair play. I didn't think I was going to get an answer. Right <laughs> What's your most controversial opinion about the beer industry generally? Uh, my most controversial opinion about the beer industry. Hmm. So it has to do with packaging. And I think this is a metaphor for how little the big beer businesses care about beer. So if you package beer in a bottle that isn't dark brown, the beer is going to be damaged. So the wavelengths of light that penetrate a green bottle, a clear bottle, they cause it beer to go off, they um, cause a beer to skunk. So any beer that's not in a dark brown bottle, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money, that beer is permanently damaged. Wow. Heineken in green bottles. It is indeed. Wow. Don't waste your money. What's your favourite BrewDog marketing campaign ever? So I was uh, picking up my daughter, Evie, who's, uh, who's 10 now. She was four years old. And uh, I got to the nursery gate and her teacher was like, James, please come here. I'm so concerned about your daughter. I want to speak to you. And I'm like, oh, my God, OK. And she was like, James, it's normal for kids to have crazy active imaginations. But the stuff that Evie tells me on a consistent basis is just way, way, way out there. She told me that last week you were hanging out of a helicopter over the Bank of England throwing taxidermy cats with parachutes out of the helicopter. I just don't know where she where she gets this nonsense from. And I was the teacher, yeah, that, that actually happened yeah, last weekend. That was, <laughs> yeah. that, That's what I did last I, weekend. I showed her the photo and she was like, oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, for, for that reason, I love that one. It was uh, the campaign was called Death to the Fat Cats. I'm scared of heights. We were hanging out of a helicopter rounded up as a... Uh, is is true dog, but we've done so many. We almost got arrest, and um, we almost got arrested when we projected ourselves naked onto the houses of Parliament. Um, we petitioned Parliament again to change the law to get a two third pint glass legalised in the UK. We drove a tank through the streets of London to announce our announce our bar in Camden. So, I love I love so many of them. But yeah, um, hanging out of a helicopter with the with the taxidermy cats and the parachutes got to be a highlight. Wow. What's the biggest risk you think you've taken that's actually paid off? Oh, I think every, like with our business, it was just risk after risk after risk. And I always said to Mart and I always said to the team, like this business is going to be one of two things. This is going to be a massive global hit or we are going to crash and burn completely. But that is totally fine because the space in between is boring. Before I was running the business, I was captain of a fishing boat. If I end up back in a fishing boat, amazing because I love doing that. But like, I just don't want to be in that space in between. I want to take risk after risk after risk. I want to put everything in line for what we believe in. I want to take massive gambles and I want to back ourselves to find a way to make these gambles pay off. So like, the history of our business is almost a history of massive gamble after massive gamble. Which kind of makes sense for you then eventually opening a store in Vegas. Yes, yes, yes. And on the opening night of uh, opening night of Vegas, we did an amazing opening night. Uh, we gave away a million dollar bar tab wow. to the most intoxicated person on the planet who later had to be escorted from the premises because he had too much beer. But it's maybe what happens if you give away a but million one, dollar bar tab. But one a million dollars? Um, yeah, in a bar tab, yeah, to be used over five years. That's incredible. <laughs> what, they got so pissed that night they had to be taken out. I mean, it, it fits. It fits. It fits. Why not? Out in a yeah, bar, why not? Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the night... Are you giving us that anymore? <laughs> you know, one and done. At the end of the night, it was two o'clock in the morning, uh, finance director was there, head of our bar business was there. I, would say, I said to him, okay, let's go and get $5,000 out of the safe. Let's take it to the casino and let's play one hand of blackjack. If we lose, I'm going to put the money back in the safe myself so the team don't lose that. If we win, um, it all goes to the team in a tip. So we go to the casino. It takes ages with passports and ID to kind of play a hand that big. Uh, we play the hand. We get blackjack on the hand. We win $12,500. We take it back and we just give it to the team in cash. That's wicked. You've got blackjack on the hand? <laughs> Lucky. Fucking hell. We're going to go to Vegas with this guy. Our yeah. finance director was like dancing about in the, in the, in the aisle. <laughs> um, what is the biggest mistakes that you see young entrepreneurs making nowadays? So I love investing. I love supporting entrepreneurs. 
the biggest mistake, and I want to shoot them in the fucking head for this, is they haven't started a business and they're talking to me about their exit strategy. I feel like shaking them and saying, your exit strategy needs to be to die in that seat. Your mm -hmm. exit strategy needs to be to want to be doing this when you're 70 years old because you've built something so fucking amazing that you just don't want to part with it. I just hate it when people haven't done anything or just built something small and they're speaking about exit strategy. I think it's a completely wrong it's mindset. It's very true. I well, it's an interesting I, I focus one, Focus on building something amazing. You're right, but it's so but interesting, it's, it's isn't it? Because to an investor... when they do. Totally, but to an investor, the <laughs> thesis is you need to show them how they'll get their money back. So you have to have this this made-up concept that we all know is stupid. Yeah, as in your exit strategy. Yeah, you know it's yeah. stupid, but then most investors wouldn't want to invest unless they can see what that outcome of that mm. would be, which is dumb. But even if the well. entrepreneur wants to stay there, okay, you've got an investor in five years' time, replace it with a different investor who's with you for that part sure. of the journey and yeah. go again and go again and go again. So I see them making that mistake. The other mistake that I see them making as well is they confuse community with audience and they're massively, massively different things. So I'll ask a company about their community and they'll say, okay, we've got 20,000 followers on Instagram. That's an audience. That is not yeah. a community. To have a community. engagement on that. Yeah, exactly. Totally you need two-way communications. You need a shared sense of purpose. You need a shared sense of belonging. You need a mission. You need people like buy in, like don't confuse community and audience. They're two different things. And for me, the best companies win because they've got the most engaged audience. So focus on audience and focus on dying behind that desk. Love it. Do you measure success in a different way now than you used to when you started? Well, when I started, I was working on a fishing boat. I moved back in with my dad because I couldn't afford to pay myself. I lived in my dad's spare room until I was 30. Martin lived in his mum's couch until he was 30. And success was building something remarkable, building something amazing, making a difference, making the beer industry better and that's kind of first and foremost what we set out to do and it's so many times in the journey i always said to the team like i don't care what our numbers are for next year i don't care how much we're going to turn over in two three years time here's what i care about i care about how passionate we are about the beer i care about how much integrity we have behind the process of what we do i care about how we engage our community i care about how we look after our people and if we focus on doing those things well I know that the sales numbers in two, three, four years time are going to be the best they possibly can be because those are the main drivers. And what I don't want to do is make any compromises in those things to hit a number. So for me, success is how well we can stay and hold true to our principles. And I almost think any business, it's a test to like, you've got your principles. So many things are going to try and kick you off course and knock you. How much can you hold true to those principles in a storm when things are difficult, when things are challenging? And the best companies do amazing things when they're small and stop doing those things when they scale. For me, the companies that change the world are the companies that entrench the things they do when they're small so much that they just do them on automatic on repeat when they scale. So one of the things I notice uh, a lot on your Instagram especially, yeah. but you seem like a very healthy guy. Yes. So what are your typical like daily healthy habits now and how yeah. are they different to when you were running BrewDog? Like, you know, there's a really interesting, uh, you know, reality sometimes for entrepreneurs who neglect their health while building a big unicorn and then wait for it till later. Who is the James we're meeting now? What are the habits? And is it the same as what it used to be? The habits were absolutely the same. And it's such false economy to neglect that and leave it for later. And I've always thought, like anyone who's running a business, you need to think of yourself as a high performance athlete. How you are is going to determine the destiny of your career, but also the business. How engaged, how focused, how hard you can work, how much you can push it like how you can like bounce back after a two day trip to Japan and have a meet in America and be on your A game. And you can only do those things if you look after yourself. And I know if I don't make the time to do the things that keep me healthy and focused, I'm taking a seven out of 10 version of James to those important meetings, not a 10 out of 10 version of James. I know if I don't find the time to exercise and do the other things that's important for me, if I work for 10 hours a day, I'm gonna be working at 60% effectiveness as opposed to 80 or 90 percent effectiveness so for me the opportunity cost of not looking after myself is just so high that i simply have to have to do it there's not so much of a thing as like a typical day but there's things that i have to ensure that i do enough of throughout the day so i've got a checklist so every night before i go to bed i do a few things i always write down the three, three things that i'm most grateful for that day and it's something i get my daughters wow. to do i do as well 
as well. It's, it's such a lovely exercise for my daughters. By the way, I just bought my daughter uh, the uh, five minute journal for kids, the little mm. gratitude thing. I'm, I'm going to start with her this weekend. Yeah. Over the last decade, Chris and I have started over a dozen businesses. It's not something we're particularly proud of, by the way, but it means we've had a lot of exposure to different business banks. You try one, you're not so happy, try another, you're not so happy. The cycle goes on. Um, by this point, between us, we were laughing, but we tried them all. There was one we actually hadn't, and it's because they're newer, and we weren't really familiar with the fact that they had this option. So we wanted to try that based on our own knowledge and compare it. And I tell you what, it is head and shoulders above, and we are thrilled to be using and partnering with Wise Business. Basically, Wise Business is the only account you need to get paid, pay employees and suppliers, and manage your business's money in multiple currencies. Exactly. With WISE, you can do business across the world, pay, get paid, and manage your business's international money with ease. And look, here's the thing. You actually save money as you grow. No hidden fees, no sneaky markups on exchange rates, and no ongoing subscription costs. It's like finding money in your pocket that you didn't know was there. But my favorite part, and this is crucial, it's just so damn easy to use. I know because I'm the one who set it up for this company. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, lazy, I was never going to get you to do it. But anyway, you can make payments in as little as a few seconds and it integrates with all your business software. You can easily withdraw funds from Amazon, Stripe and more in multiple currencies. And it connects to accounting softwares like Xero and QuickBooks. But damn, what about security? Well, as you know, every time you try and log in and take money out of the account without Never checking with that. us first, the security is amazing. They've got two-factor authentication, a 24-7 customer support team, and a fraud team working around the clock to keep Chris off our money. I could go on about all of the amazing features, but seriously, when you're a small company or even just starting one, there's already so much going on that having a payment service that's quick, easy, and by the way, most importantly, reliable, is just an absolute necessity. And for that reason, we use WISE. If you want to get on board, it's simple. Just head to wise.com slash business to learn more about how WISE could work for your business. It's, it's amazing. It's like such a great way to connect on something that's kind of really important. So I always do that. And I've got a checklist of things that I need to do to keep myself kind of healthy and focused. And I aim to have done at least four of them every single day. So things in that checklist are exercise. So I love exercise, love CrossFit, like any type of exercise. I love, I love ice baths. I think it's the best thing that I do. It's always a thing that I want to do least and the thing that I feel best after I've done it. I can't meditate. I would love to. I just end up sitting with thinking with my eyes closed, but I love doing NSDRs, non-sleep deep stress, help keep me focused. Calm almost kind of defragments my mind. Um, I do sauna a few times a week. I love to read, so I need to make sure that I can read in kind of 30 minute blocks at least four or five times a week. I've also got this exercise that I love doing called scatter focus. So I set a timer for 20 minutes, no devices, no distractions, one blank sheet of A4 paper and whatever's in my head, whatever I want to think about, I scribble down. That is kind of really important for me as well. Um, get fresh air, be outside early in the day. So I look to do two walking meetings a day. I think it's so unhealthy to be stuck behind a desk all the time. So make sure that I do two walking meetings. I've got this little kind of checklist and I need to ensure that I've done four of those things each day. And I know if I haven't, then I haven't been the best version of me for that day. When did you first experience getting a lot of money yourself? Because obviously <laughs> you've built a very big company, but we all know that typically when building a big company, you don't actually make much money from it very early on and often don't for a very long time. So when did it first financially change your own life? I don't think I've told this story before, but it was uh, simultaneously the best and the worst day of my life. So um, never had any money of any significance or any note until 2017 when we did a deal with a big US private equity company. And as, as part of that deal, I uh, I got 50 million for a small amount of my shares in the company. Amazing, life-changing, fantastic. Uh, the money was transferred- 50 into, million. Yeah. Yeah, that'll do it. The money was transferred into our lawyer's bank account. Um, TSG were in Scotland that evening. We had some beers to celebrate. We had an event the next day, fine. Money was in our lawyer's bank account. Come Monday, my amazing assistant at the time contacted lawyers, okay, from the client account, here's a set up a new bank account, especially here's the deals for James' new bank account. Here's where the money should go. Confirmed it, bang. Next day, no money. I'm like, uh-oh. Next day, no money. Bethany, phone the lawyers, what's happened? She phones them up. They've transferred it, James. It should just be a wee banking delay. Oh, Next wow. day, no money. We get to the Friday. The money's still not in my bank account. I'm like, what the hell? Like, what's happened here? Spend a weekend panicking in a cold sweat. 
get to the Monday, we phone the lawyers again and we get the bank details that they put in. And my assistant, God bless her, who's lovely and amazing, she was one digit out with the bank oh my details God. that she gave the lawyers. So we're this two days in like limbo. We're speaking to the bank and the bank's like, God, we verbally confirmed those details for with 50 you. 50 million. 50 million. 50 million. 50 million. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got to do this 10 years of work all over again. What am I going to do? I'm like back to square. I'm back. To, it's like hard to describe the feeling of like never had any kind of money of note. Getting 50 million and the money being sent to a wrong bank account and the money being lost. So it's lost. It's lost. We contact the bank and the oh bank's like, God. you gave us like, you verbally, it's like, there's nothing we can there's nothing we can do here, but like we're trying to try and help you, but there's just to manage expectations. There's no guarantee. We don't know where it is. We're going to look into it. We're going to get one of our teams to look into it, oh but the money God. could be anywhere now. And unfortunately, if it's landed in a bank account, they could have hopped it. The, 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 just to manage expectations, the money could be gone. And I remember cycling home that night and thinking it's like 10 years of work. Yeah. <laughs> one false digit, like gone. So it gets to... Can you imagine how horrendous your EA was? I'm going to tell you both something when you finish the story, <laughs> which you're going to be like, fucking hell. So we get we get to the Thursday and the bank's okay, we've managed to track it down. We're in contact with the bank. I'm like, thank, thank goodness. And then by the Friday, they'd managed to get it bank for the other, managed to get it back for the other bank that was somewhere in Eastern Europe. And oh, so the God. bank held it. And by the Monday, so 15 days later, it ended up, oh in, in, it ended up in my bank account. But... I, it's so many points during that 15 days. I'm just going to have to do it again. Fine, I'll do it again. <laughs> the uh, the funny thing is, you know, earlier I was like, I have to call my lawyer. Mm. My I'm getting sent my payment while we're on basically today <laughs> for selling a company. And so I should be getting it now that you've told that story. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I went outside the room to put in my Check details. those numbers. I know. Check like, those numbers. Now I'm like sweating. Like, did I put it in the right place? Um, so yeah, after the episode, I'll let you know. <laughs> I, I couldn't sleep for two weeks. That's Just, crazy. That is horrendous, though. Yeah. So, um, what's the answer to the question? What was the question again? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. So, well, like, I mean, how, he got fifty million when they sold to private equity. Yeah, totally. How, how many how's years that changed in? Changed your life. Uh, that was te- that was ten years in. So that was in twenty seventeen. Mm. Up until then, had you been paid a lot? <laughs> oh no. Um, so, <laughs> for the first six years of the business, we didn't pay ourselves at all. Uh, for this kind of few years after that, we paid ourselves four hundred and fifty pounds a month. And for the first few years of the business, I was still working part time as a North Atlantic captain because I couldn't afford to pay myself. So I needed some form of income from somewhere. So I think before we did that private equity deal, I was paying myself maybe 60 or 70,000 a year. And what does life look like now? I mean, we're we're, we're a long way on from that moment as well now, right? Yeah. yeah, When was that? 2017. That's 2017. So we're seven years on. Wow. Okay. And so what, what what does life with money look like now different for you? I guess like as a person, like, friends exactly the same like all my best friends are people that i used to work with in the fishing boat i absolutely love them um house that i live up in scotland is kind of pretty much the same type of house and setup is i've got a really nice apartment in london which yeah, which, which you've been to so i spent a bit of money in and that and it just means i'm able to like do things and go places that i want to it means i'm able to invest in things that i'm passionate about like my own health the health and wellness of my family and it means i'm able to kind of invest in other businesses and try and help them in their journeys as Amazing. well so it's 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 been massively positive and I'm very grateful to have built a business and been able to take some money off the off the table. But I think there's a kind of old saying that kind of money just makes you more of the same of what you were before. Mm-hmm. So if you're an asshole before, you're even more of one. If you're a kind person before, you're even more of one. So I don't think it's changed that much. And I think that philosophy I had in those kind of two weeks when I thought the money was lost, it's like, we'll just do it again. I think mm-hmm. there's like a skill set. There's like an mm-hmm. ambition. So I'm never kind of too bound to money in Maybe it's a bit too much faith in my own ability or something, but I, I kind of would back myself to start something again and build something again and be able to monetize that again, which means, okay, there's money, but hey, we can make more money if we need to. Hmm. Reflecting on your comment about Elon Musk, hmm. um, he's clearly a person where there is no amount of money that makes any difference to him. He's totally just mission oriented yeah. and that's all yeah. he cares about. And his mission is big enough and mad enough that hmm. it, it can't be completed. Yeah. So that ambition level when you read that book you, you do really you know, all the things you said you do feel inferior you do feel like you'll never be you'll never have that natural ambition I didn't feel that. um and it's and it's kind of psychotic in its own way as well it's unhealthy in many ways um and you need it to do what he does do you feel like um because of the extra level of comfort and ease and reality that money gives you mm-hmm. the space essentially do you feel like that is counterproductive to your ambition levels? Like, can James Watt do another brew dog? Like, in theory, yes, but in practice, because of how 
great your lifestyle is now, like, does it kind of get in the way? Do those two competing ideologies conflict with each other? Not in any way, shape or form. And there's this lifestyle, but there's like what's inside and what drives you. And those two things are independent. And I guess if you're kind of strip it back, I think so many entrepreneurs who kind of build something remarkable, they're compensating for something. They're trying to make up for some <laughs> trauma. They're trying to like overcome some kind of deep seated feeling of inadequacy or kind of not belonging. And that gives them like a focus and a desire and a drive. Not always, but I think for me, that was definitely, definitely the case. And like I had always in my head that to like do what I want to do and to feel good at myself, I want to build multiple unicorns. That was what, like, that was the challenge wow. I set myself. So I've got one in the bag and to be honest, I never thought I would do something for as long as I did. I was CEO for 17 years, but I just love the business, the people, the mission, what we were doing. But as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, like the challenge I've set for myself and what I want to do over the course of my career is build two plus unicorns. And that's that's what I'm focused on. And for me, that is the that is the goal to feel good about my kind of life's body of work. What's the next unicorn? Well, it's it's so difficult because like to build a unicorn, you need so many things to go in your favor. So you need a great company, a great plan, a great community. You need engagement. You need to be in the right space at the right time. You need a bit of kind of market dynamics to, to, to go with you. So let's see. I've got a few startups at the moment. I've got a few other things that I'm working to launch. And it depends on a few things. But that is a goal for me to try and build kind of two plus unicorn businesses. Mm. Very cool. What are some consumer businesses in general? Because obviously with BrewDog, yeah. such a knack and such an eye for how to build a giant consumer business. Yeah. So what are some that you think like uh, could do that? So I am so privileged and honored to be their first investor. I'm their lead investor. It's the company in my portfolio where I spend the most time at the moment. But I am absolutely obsessed with Tallow Nash. Yeah, they're wicked. They are absolutely phenomenal. Founded by Matt and Kira. They're a couple. They've just had a baby. They're looking to shape, shake up laundry detergent. And there's so many parallels I see, I see to kind of Drew Dog cool. back in 2007. A sector dominated by a few behemoths, no innovation, no passion for the customer, everyone too comfortable. What's better about it is every household in the UK buys laundry detergents, mm. 50% of them buy beer, margins are really good as well, but their packaging, their product, their naming, and how they are building community for me is the gold standard in building community. They're 14 months old, they've got more followers online than the top five selling UK laundry detergent brands combined. Mm. Um, <laughs> they're doing 30 million laundry revenue despite only being wow. 14 months old, and that is just D to C. We've got all <laughs> the supermarkets really keen to do something with us. We've got customers from all over the planet and like how they run their socials, how they engage community. It is just absolutely textbook and how to build a modern consumer brand by putting the like, customer first and foremost in what we do so for me that one 100 unicorn potential and so excited to be in there from day one with the founders you've just got engaged i have just got engaged yes congratulations for the second time for the second time <laughs> which one was better <laughs> um i'll tell Where you my georgia is in the other room <laughs> watching this as we speak so um, this, it's actually this, true so. this one this one was amazing yeah it was last friday and just been like so much happiness and like love and connection and just like yeah it's been it's been amazing i think it helps if the first time you propose it's full of bitterness and anger <laughs> like, yeah the content is excellent that yeah. <laughs> so that's not your only big news recently you have formally stepped back as ceo from brewdog can you tell us about that experience yeah so i ran the business for 17 and a half years as ceo which is longer than i ever intend to do anything but i just Love the business, the people, the product, the like the passion, the locations. It's just such an amazing business to be in. So it was a, it was a tough thing to do, but I, I want to build multiple fantastic businesses over the course of my career. And like I love being in build mode. It's where I get my energy, it's where I get my focus. I love creating things that don't exist. I love trying to kind of challenge the status quo and take on an industry and Drew Dog with the best one in the world. I love it, but a good year is now ten or fifteen percent growth and a bad year is five percent growth. So like we've got 4,000 people, we make a million cans of beer a day, we operate in 60 countries and I love the business to pieces, but I think there's people that can run a business of that size and scale better than, than I can and there's certain elements about it. I love it. I'm not disappointed about not having to sit in eight hours of back-to-back -back Zoom meetings about 2026 20, budgets and sales projections anymore. So I've um, got a fantastic team and it's just a business I love being part of, but excited about the next chapter for myself incredible when do you decide to step down like how does that process work in your in your mind and then in reality i decided to do it before covid wow i decided to do it before covid and i had someone in the team before covid that one of the best people i've ever worked with 
and I wanted to offer them the opportunity to lead lead the business and I felt then was the right time for me to to move on so that would have been about kind of 13 13 years into the the journey which I felt was an amazing time and then COVID happened and I felt there's no way I can do this during COVID like ships need captains I need to be at the forefront I need to lead the business through this journey and it took me a few years after COVID until I felt the business was in the right place to do it but it was actually something I wanted to do before before COVID. What was the shape and size of the business pre-COVID that you were like okay it's time and then how did you weather COVID? I mean COVID was just so so difficult for us as a as a business and I remember like before the kind of furlough scheme came in yeah we had 1500 people that we were paying but we couldn't open the doors to the bar we had leases that we were paying rent for in 70 locations in the UK but we weren't able to take customers in we didn't know if we'd be able to get our teams in to kind of help us to make the beer I was sleeping in a sleeping bag on the kind of floor of the office and spray Elon Musk at least well yeah and it's the only time I've done this I just didn't know if the business would make it I broke down in tears in front of the team because I thought everyone was going to lose their jobs and the business was going to was going to fold and the next day I was like okay James let's just get out of panic mode and let's get into, get into action mode let's put a plan in place let's continue making as much beer as we can but let's try and do some good here so we pivoted our distillation business and we made and donated over a million pounds worth of hand sanitizer to the NHS and key frontline workers and we just thought okay we are going to fight our way through this and okay the business might go but if the business goes we are going to fight like hell to kind of try and keep it going but incredibly incredibly difficult for the business we lost a lot of money during COVID because we had all this overhead, but no revenue coming in against it. And it was just a, a really, really tough time. Wow. In your journey with BrewDog over 17 years, what are some of the most challenging parts of that journey that you could highlight to listeners? You know, you, you've obviously talked about, including on Secret Leaders, you talked about, you know, the story of BrewDog. Yep. Um, you know, I'd love to know the sort of, for the listeners this time round. Yep really key lessons and opportunities so they can dig in (laughs) what are the moments you know what's funny about being an entrepreneur everyone thinks that we're these super productive machines crushing it 24 7 but let me tell you a secret half the time i'm just trying to figure out where i saved that one important file from three weeks ago really but you're so organized yeah well i'm about to be because i've been testing the hp omnibook ultra flip and oh my god This thing is like having a personal assistant that actually knows what they're doing. All right. You know those days when you've got back-to-back calls? Well, you're about to make some great first impressions because the Poly Camera Pro is insane. It tracks your face, fixes the lighting, and makes you look like you've had a professional film crew, even when you're working from your kitchen. Yeah, it's tough to focus when you're out of focus. I might legitimately look better in the Poly Camera Pro than I do in person. I shouldn't even bother having in-person meetings anymore. Anyway, here's where it gets really interesting. You know we're always talking about working smarter and not harder. Yeah, that's very much your thing. I haven't quite mastered it like you just yet. I've told you, delegate. Let the HP AI companion focus on the research so you can focus on what really matters. It can analyze documents, summarize reports, and even help you draft content. It can even summarize 10,000 words in seconds. Wow, that's actually really amazing. I know. Here's what I love most about the AI companion. It just helps you get to the point. Yeah, I'm a vision person. So let's keep things at the top so we can make a decision and move forward. Exactly. The AI companion can analyze an entire research paper in seconds, pull out the main insights and even suggest action items. Work smarter with the right tools. Work doesn't have to feel like work. Look, I've built and sold companies worth millions. And I can tell you the HP Omnibook Ultra Flip isn't just another laptop. It's like having an entire support team built into your computer. And here's the thing, whether you're just starting out or scaling up, this is the kind of tech that actually makes the difference. It's not just fancy features. It's about giving you back time to focus on what matters, building your business. This isn't just an upgrade. It's an absolute game changer. And trust me, once you try it, you'll wonder how you ever managed without it. For 10% off, use our code HPLOVEWORK. That's H-P-L-O-V-E-W-O-R-K. Valid until 31st of January. T's and C's apply. UK only. Oh, so, so many. And like, why I like working with kind of startups and founders and scale-ups at the moment is I can share the successes and things I've done well, but I can also like, this are the mistakes, this are the challenges, and hopefully you can learn from the good things and the, and the bad things. And we've had so many challenging times and I'll, I'll kind of highlight a few of them like the first time we took on investment we went from having no money to having money and 
if I could go back and do anything differently with the company, I would go back to that day after we took investment. And I still I kick myself for this. You feel like, okay, I've got a hundred million pounds now sitting in the company bank account. I need to put that to work. I need to do something with that money. And that just ended up with us investing in things that we shouldn't. And I, as a CEO, when you get that much money in your bank account, when you haven't had it before, you've got a responsibility to kind of instill the same behaviors in the team. And, mm. I, and I tried to do that, but I didn't do it well enough. And the team thought, well, well, if we've got that money, then it's okay to spend in this and it's okay mm. to hire that pair. Mm. So overheads go out of control and that kind of discipline and that kind of diligence kind of goes out. So I would say if like the entire history of the business where I made the most mistakes was in the aftermath of taking private equity money, where I didn't keep us true enough to our principles, where I wasn't focused enough on delivering excellent value for every pound that we spent. And like we hired a whole heap of senior, fancy, expensive people and we ended up letting them go because they weren't right for a company. We made a few acquisitions because I felt, okay, we need to work this cash somehow as opposed to have it sitting in the bank account. Those acquisitions turned out to be the wrong choice for us as a company and we're not the type of company that should make acquisitions. We've tried to open too many locations. Some of those locations didn't work out and just a kind of series of mistakes of like what not to do when you take private equity money in terms of the company. And I think that's when a CEO, when a leader needs to fight hardest to kind of stay true to their principles. And there's just going to be this kind of tide towards kind of spending and investing. And you just need to kind of keep that diligence and keep that strappiness. And I think we've got it back now, but we lost that strappiness for, for a while, which is definitely one of the kind of biggest mistakes. And it led to a whole heap of challenges. I suppose also culturally, right? Like bringing it back to the core culture is very hard if you've let the, the attitude from people slip. Yeah, and like some of the worst examples for me was we had to let go six or seven people for cheating on their expenses. And it just like to go wow. from all of a sudden, <clears throat> we're all in this together. We're trying to build this amazing thing. We're trying to change the face of beer to expenses fraud. It was like, whoa, to like theft, to like people stealing from the business all of a sudden. It's just like a kind of very sobering moment. And that's like, any company with a few thousand people, these kind of things are going to happen. But it's just like, a, oh, this is a long way from two humans and a dog kind of making beer in a in a shed. So a lot of challenges, a lot of learnings. And it kind of takes me back to that kind of core thesis of every company sets out with a set of principles, with a way of doing things. Most companies lose that along the way in the journey. The companies that keep that, the companies that kind of do and build remarkable things. And there was a period where we, we lost that. And just led to challenges that we're probably kind of still working through. So if I could go back and do anything differently in the journey, the day after the money comes in, I would have written a manifesto. It's like, this is what we've done up until now. This is how we're going to do things in the future. Money or no money, it's not going to change anything about what we do. So from an inspiration point of view, do you follow the Jeff Bezos kind of Amazon strategy with that, you know, the sort of frugality that runs through the company? Well, two years after we took on the investment money, we actually made from Jeff Bezos, it's always day one, one of our key principles, mm -hmm. we call them dogmas. We've got 10 dogmas in terms of how we run the company. So mm -hmm. we kind of incorporated that, kind of try to like infuse it in our DNA almost. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> you went on Dragon's Den quite early on in yeah. your uh, run. And if I haven't got this wrong, yeah. you were ready to give up 20% of BrewDog for £100,000, which would have been the most lucrative deal in Dragon's Den history. Can you talk us through why it didn't happen? Yeah, so we were so excited. Always been a massive fan of anything business. Like Dragon's Den was like my go-to TV show. Um, and we actually didn't get to pitch the dragons because on the day that we were supposed to, we did a screen test with the producers and the producers turned us down. So we were ready to go and pitch, but we didn't get to go and pitch. But we got up at 3.30 that morning. We had to go down to Manchester. We drove down in Martin's beat up, dusty, champagne coloured, Vauxhall Vectra, the kind of champagne supernova, as we called it. We were both wearing suits. What the hell? Um, at the moment, I just own one suit, and it's the one I was married in the first time. Um, but anyway, we've got down, and we do. Uh, George is not keen on me wearing that for the second wedding, but I think yeah. sustainability. Maybe it's a maybe it's a good thing. Hi, Georgia. Um, so yeah, we got down, and we like practiced this pitch over and over and over and over again. We thought the pitch was amazing, and we're doing the final stream test to the producers, supposed to see the dragons later that day. And the producers after the pitch was like, "Guys, we just we just don't see it. We just don't think this business wow. is investment worthy." So we've got two businesses, too many to hear here today. So we're not going to put you in front of the, the dragons, but we were going to give them 20% for a hundred thousand pounds. And then they probably negotiate on that. So you probably end up giving yeah. them 25% or even 30% for a hundred thousand pounds, but we didn't, we didn't get that far. 
Do you remember what stage the business was at at that point? Yeah, we were probably turning that year was good to turn over maybe eight or nine hundred thousand pounds. So we were small. The first year we turned over sixty seven thousand yeah. pounds, then four hundred, then the next year we turned over just under a million. Wow, so. though, I mean, even with that turnover, they let them on. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Mm. yeah, for a beer company as well back then. I know. Yeah, that's wild. But one of the best things that ever happened to us, and for me. Like any obstacle, any knockback, any constraint has to be an opportunity. And for me, that's what differentiates good companies from absolutely amazing companies. You've got to take the knockbacks. You've got to take the obstacles and use them to find a new way of doing things, to up your level, to kind of up your thinking. You can't get all kind of doom and gloom about it. So it was like, okay, we're not going to get investment for the dragons. We can't pin our hopes on that. Like we've got to come up with a different way of doing things. This was 2009, global financial crisis couldn't get any more money for the banks so we launched something that was unheard of at the time online equity crowdfunding we called it equity punks and it's been so key to our business but if we take an investment for the den mm. we wouldn't have been forced to come up with equity for punks which has been so key to what we've done i mean it's a good point i mean besides the beer brewdog has kind of been known as like a genius marketing company and so i suppose was it was it the challenge of the business not going at the speed that you wanted that forced you to say like how do we get into mainstream press yeah exactly so we set out we were absolutely tiny we were in an industry dominated by behemoths and this was before draft beer was cool this was before draft mm. beer was a thing this was before people loved ipas like people drunk industrial laggers sleepy cascales that was it in kind of 2006 2007 so we're up against these global behemoths thousands of times our size who spend tens or hundreds of millions each year in advertising like there's just no way we can compete so it's like okay to compete we're gonna have to do things which are edgy which are provocative which get the name out there which maybe cause a little bit of unrest or upheaval or it's like a bit stunty or a bit gorilla. but if we don't like i'm back in the fishing boat we don't have a business we get lost in the in the mix here so we had a few tests that we always kind of applied so the first test was if we spend a pound in a thing can we get a 10x return versus our competition? Because if they're getting the same return market-wise as we are, then we're never going to close that gap. We're going to end up tiny. And the second test we used was, would or could another company do this thing? And if the answer was yes, we needed to, okay, let's not do that. Let's upper level. Let's do something that only we can do. Let's do something that only we're happy to take a risk on, that we're happy to gamble on. Could or would another company sponsor a sports team? Yes. Could or would another company throw cats out of a helicopter over the Bank of England? No. You know, obviously doing um, marketing stunts has very much been a brew dog thing. Which one of the stunts do you think uh, best exemplifies or was the most audacious and bold that really uh, took you to another level, helped you become a multi-billion dollar brand? Oh, there's been there's been so many of them. So when we made the world's strongest ever beard at 55 percent and packaged it in taxidermy, it was a, it was a global news story that kind of shock and awe. And I think if you want to kind of change people's perceptions, you have to shock them a little bit. You have to kind of get that jolt into them. So that one was absolutely amazing for us. Uh, when we parodied the Russian resident at the time of the Sochi Winter Olympics, which involved me half naked and a horse in a freezing February day in, in Scotland, that one felt like it kind of shifted, shifted gears for us as a company as well. Um, just the whole concept of equity punks kind of connecting with community was absolutely massive for us. Um, making a beer at the bottom of the ocean, which just looked amazing, but at the bottom of the ocean in Scotland at that time was 10 degrees Celsius, perfect for fermenting a lager. Mm. Just getting a tank and kind of driving it through the streets of London, absolutely fantastic. Uh, doing a bad beer amnesty where people could take a can of mainstream beer into any of Drew Bar and swap it for one of her own beers. So <laughs> we've tried to make sure, so stunts, yes, but if you just do stunts, it's noise, it's shouting, it's not going to land. So we had a very clear playbook okay, if we are going to do a stunt, it's a risk, because any stunt is a risk, because otherwise com every company would do stunts. And I presume and, we've had a bunch that didn't work. Oh, we've had a bunch that didn't work, which I'll speak about in a second. But uh, we, we said, okay, if we're going to do a stunt, two things absolutely have to be true. We have to somehow find a way to tie this back to the thing that we're passionate about, then use this as a platform to speak about what we're passionate about. If it's got no link, if there's no way to tie it back, not going to work. And secondly, is there a community element in there? Because the community is a thing that differentiates our business. So bad beer amnesty, community are taking the beer to us. Throwing a cat out of a helicopter, the community are investing in our business. 
So those things had to be true for us to do a stunt. And I think that that's what made the stunts land and kind of push the business forward. And how many, you need know, to talk about having a playbook for stunts. So um, how many stunts does it take to have a hit? <laughs> is it one in two? Is it one in 10? And share some of your bad stunts that went well, I guess if they don't go well, we don't hear about them, but... Ooh, no, you do hear about them, but in a bad way. So, okay, cool. <laughs> so, so, so in a bad way. So I think with stunts, it's like so on the edge, it's either a hit or a miss. Because what you're doing is so noteworthy, people are going to speak about it, so they're going to speak about it positively, or they're going to speak about it negatively. So it's not like one in ten people hear about it. Like if you're doing a stunt and you're doing it properly, people hear about every stunt. Um, some of the misses... And the lesson from some of the misses was, is people have got such a short attention span. So if they don't get the context and the message in a tiny snapshot, that is lost. They just see the stunt, they're going to attack the stunt. So I think it was back in 2018 or 19 for International Women's Day, we wanted to do a beer that highlighted the gender pay gap and do something about that and do something that kind of sent money to, to kind of try and close that gender pay gap. So we did a beer where we sold it to women for, I think it was 18% cheaper than we sold it to men, which was the gender pay gap at the at the time. And we also wanted to parody products which we felt were overtly marketed to women and a bit tacky and a bit stringy because of that. So tongue in cheek, we called this pink IPA and we did it 18% less and it was tongue in cheek and it was supposed to be a parody, but people just saw pink IPA and they thought we were the thing that we were parodying. So we took a huge hammer and fur it and it was like, a project that was led by the women on their team where we're giving the difference in sales to charities and we're trying to raise awareness to something we're passionate about but we got hammered for doing something mm. that was supposed to be a parody but people didn't see that it was a, it was a parody um, also we got hammered when we took a stand against the World Cup in Qatar so oh, we yeah. did this, I do remember that we that did was fantastic this, well yeah so we did this advert which was um, I think it was like first Russia then Qatar next up North Korea and it just created this massive, massive media storm. Now, we were taking a stand for human rights, and it was a stand that was super, super important for us to take. The thing that tripped us up in that one is we had a few distributors in the region. We weren't selling beer in Qatar at the time, but one of those distributors, unbeknown to us, had sent some beer into the Qatari market. Mm. But like any business of any scale, like at the moment, if there's a market that we don't sell to, one of our customers somewhere is going to slip it into the black market. So we had beer in Qatar. So we got hammered for having beer in Qatar, even though we didn't know about it because we did this kind of big advertising campaign. So that was one that kind of, those two flipped on mm. us, which should have been positive. It was causes that we were passionate about, but those ones came back to, back to bite us. Is, is all, is, sorry, one more question. Yeah, you go. Is all PR good PR? No. So no, what's, no. What's, what's some examples of really just horrendous PR so, that you've had that you just wish would go away? Oh, so much. I mean, we are <laughs> the kind of, I guess, the kind of poster child for like amazing stunts and amazing marketing, but also the kind of poster child for media backlash. I call it tall poppy syndrome. I call it what you want, but like we have had such a tough time in the media over the last few weeks and like over the last few few years, and even this week. I've been like hammered in the media from places like the New York Post, New Zealand, Herald, all over the planet for announcing an engagement on LinkedIn. So it kind of feels like we do a normal thing and we get criticized in the in the media for it. And there's like such a misconception of our kind of work and culture and how we are to work for. And we put so much time and effort to be the best company we can to work for. Are we perfect? No. Is any company perfect? No. Um, but we've been like in the Sunday Times top 100 companies to work for UK and UK twice in the last six years. We invest in our team. We pay a great wage. We create some benefits. But if you look at the public conception of us as an employer, like I'm more intense and evil than Darth Vader. And that's the kind of media perception, which is like so far away from the reality of the situation. It's laughable. But like we've definitely had like such a tough time in the media for like a number of fronts. And it feels like any tiny mistake or even things that's not a mistake just get amplified and like, yeah, amplify the media. And we are so clickbaity as our Dan because of the nature of what we do. So journalists know if they do a kind of provocative kind of do-dog headline, then we then it kind of turns into clickbait and then it get clicks and clicks win fries in media these days. So mm. we definitely had a tough time in the media, I would say, over the last five years. How have you handled that? Because it, it did always feel unfair to me. Mm. Um, I've only gotten, gotten to know you yeah. in the last year. Yeah. But I've always been super compassionate to yeah. you yeah. from from being a follower on LinkedIn and stuff. Yeah. Whether that's rightly or wrongly, I look at entrepreneurs always yeah. with the rose tinted goggles yeah. on because I know what it's like to yeah. be an entrepreneur and how hard it is. And 
I've interviewed, you know, almost yeah. 400 yeah. and so few do anything with bad intentions. Yeah. So few, like people, like we make mistakes. Yeah. But like actually almost everyone I've ever met really genuinely just yeah. trying to be a great boss, learning, making mistakes, yeah. but all good intentions. And you especially <laughs> have got shat on yeah. over and over and over again. And it just always felt pretty fucking harsh. The BBC yeah. especially. Yeah, I mean, it's been it's been so intense, but it's like so laughable because like anyone that knows me, anyone that's worked with me directly, like knows that that is just so far away from the reality of what we do. So like we invest in our people. We love developing careers. We love helping people achieve things. And like we've been a high growth company and we have focused on performance. Is that an environment for everyone? No. Mm -hmm. Have we always been perfect? No. But we've created 4,000 jobs. We've built an amazing company. We've paid loads of taxes. Like we've put it in the map for exporting. Have we made a few mistakes along the way? Yes, but no more than any other company going through that same growth cycle. And it just feels so odd, like the UK attitude and the kind of UK media attitude to kind of word success and people who, who build things. And it's been so frustrating and at times really tough because that kind of media portrayal is just so far away the reality of like who I am and what our business does and how we do things. Mm. But yeah. again, you can control things that you can control and there's things that's out with your control. So not playing the victim, not getting too upset about it. And I think the way that we win is continuing to build amazing things. Not playing the victim and not getting too upset about it now, but in the moment, have you been on a journey with like controlling? Because, you know, the first <laughs> time it happens and maybe even the fifth time it happens. Yeah. Surely that's very different to looking back now about it. I mean, it's 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 tough. That, I mean, there's no denying that it's that it's tough. But I think if you're going to try and achieve something, if you're trying to build something, like resilience, tenacity, are like two of the absolute most important qualities. And like at the end of the day, this is supposed to be difficult. If building an amazing mm -hmm. company was easy, and those difficulties come in loads of different forms, but if it was easy, every single person would do it, and success wouldn't mean anything. So. There's so many things it's difficult from sleepless nights to trying to make things work, to try to scale a company to logistics challenges or tech challenges or tax chat, like and or media challenges. But like, you know, if you're setting out to build something amazing, you're going to have these challenges. And I think what sets the great people and kind of great leaders apart is everyone faces the same amount of challenges in their lifetime. The best companies, the best leaders deal with those better than the people that end up not achieving things. So just need to kind of head down, keep on going, keep building and just kind of tune out the noise. I think one of the things that uh, BrewDog has been so well known for is obviously marketing. And I think that yep. through that, what's the advice you would give to new founders about how to harness PR? Because although you have yep. had a lot of bad PR, yeah. which I, I'm sure we'll talk yep. about more, the the thing that I remember you guys for, you were kind of just fucking everywhere. Yeah. And like beer yeah. brands just weren't known. Yeah. You know, like they were just the things that you saw when you went to the pub, but you guys became an actual brand. Yep. So how do you give advice to young entrepreneurs now about creating yeah. that buzz? Amazing question. So always two things. A, everything has to be underpinned by a community. If you don't have a passionate, engaged community, you've got nothing. Nothing is going to land. Nothing is going to stick. So first and foremost, the foundation is the cornerstone is community. Community is not audience. You need engagement. You need two-way communication. You need a shared sense of passion, of purpose, of mission. So get your community started and have your community engaged and build with your community. And then secondly, unless you do something differently, you're just not going to stand out. You're going to be an okay to normalish company. You've got to find a way to do things differently. If that's product, if that's innovation, if that's marketing, if that's comms, if that's stunts, if it's a blend of those things. But unless you do things differently, you might as well go back to your day job. So community, 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 and then find ways to do things that your competitors won't do and can't do. So when you when you build so much of your um, you know your business around the public image of your brand, mm -hmm. you are particularly vulnerable yes. to uh, <laughs> public opinion. So how are you nowadays? I suppose combating somewhat of the public image you have yeah. because obviously, like you said, you announced your engagement and you got <laughs> you got a lot of bad press. So how do you combat that now? Because you said you wanted to build another. Yeah, I do. And, and for me, it's just have enough channels where I share my perspective, where I share my point of view, where I engage with community directly. So if people want to know what I'm about, what I think, how I do things, how I build things, there's loads of opportunities for them to find out directly from me, not third, fourth, fifth hand, and then twisted by the media. Mm. But do you, do you think like the, obviously the bad pressure you got at the time, yeah. what do you think caused that? I'm not necessarily saying mm. either side is to blame, but what do you yeah. think caused the I remember the public letter. Yes, yes. Years ago now. So, 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 so that's a great example. So, at that time, we had eight thousand former employees. 
eight thousand people, former employees. Yes, had been. So we're working hospitality. We've got four thousand yeah. employees at the moment. Hospitality, bad turnovers. You turn over a staff member every nine months. Good turnover. Just turn over a staff member every kind of 14, 15 months. That's kind of just how it is for people who work in that in that industry. So we had a population of eight thousand ex employees. Any company with eight thousand ex employees, some are going to be happy. Some are going to be yeah. ambassadors. Some are just simply not going to be not going to be happy. And there was a few things. And was, some will be bad people. And one percent of people have mental health problems. Yes, yes, and in in our case, very much yes. So the open letter was put together, and I can speak about it now because it's a bit after the fact. But it was put together by six of our former colleagues before they sent that open letter. The average amount of time that they'd left us before they sent it was five years. So the six people behind it hadn't worked for us on average for five years. Some, the person who actually sent it, hadn't worked for us for seven years. So like such a time, like, so how can you comment on your company just now mm -hmm. if you hadn't worked for us for that that much time? Of those six, most had gone on to try and do something else in the beer industry and hadn't been successful at a time when we'd kind of gone from strength to strength in the company. And um, some of those people have got well-documented mental health issues and stuff as well. So I think it was a combination of some jealousy, some resentment, some kind of bittering, lingering kind of anger towards us for things that happened a very long time ago. And in the end, like less than like 0.5% of our former team members signed this letter. So I think those odds, like any company, like you're going to have 10% of your former employees that absolutely hate you. That is just like... What happens but like the year before that we were sunday times best company to work for on the planet mm. we were paying real living wage we were sharing 10 percent of our profits with our team i'd just given up my own salary when that came out for two years to help protect jobs through covid because i wanted to get, keep as much of our team intact as we as we could and it was just so far away from the reality of of working in our business which just made the whole thing like so crazy and then we took such a hammering for it in the media worst place to work ever most toxic boss toxic culture bullying culture i mean there's a small amount of people in any company that don't want to be held accountable that don't want to have to push to achieve something remarkable that just don't fit with how that company mm. do does things 100%. and that was the case with ours but we were just i guess unlucky in that our former employees decided to kind of weaponize it against us in this way and it's just led to all this kind of waves and waves of publicity that's just so far away from the reality of working in their business what's the what was the fallout from the current employees seeing that how did you deal with that i, mean, I think our current employees kind of felt hurt and, and offended like the business took so much criticism and like our current employees like felt that criticism yeah. like deeply from the public from the kind of media and stuff so i mean the whole thing has been a, like blown so much out of proportion for what it is, but then the media, things that are clickbaity, get clicks. It's so far away from the reality of work and our business, from our team. And you can see like before and just after, we were in the Sunday Times best 100 companies to work for in the UK, which is based on independent, anonymous surveys of our team members. Mm. It's like, there's like hundred thousands of companies in the UK and that's where we were, we were ranked. So just really, really difficult. And if I could go back and do one thing differently, and I think it's always important as a leader like anything that happens good or bad current employee former employee in the company not in the company like anything happens in the company ultimately it's my responsibility and i think it's such an important mindset shift for a leader so if i was in the uk and if somebody working on a packaging line in america or japan did something i wasn't happy with that's not their problem that's my problem i've hired the person that's hired that person i've set the tone i've set the mm -hmm. culture i've set everything and the one thing that i would have done differently and I think Zappos do this amazingly well as a business, is just kind of set expectations when people join the business. So I should have been clearer back in those early days, back in those high growth days, as to what people were joining so they were fully aware. It's like, mm. you are joining a high growth business. Yeah, I think that's fine. We are growing at 100% plus a year. That means things from time to time are going to be intense. Things from time yeah. to time are going to be hectic. From time to time, we're going to grow quicker than the policies and infrastructures we've got. This is not a stable, big corporate environment. That is the company. Yeah. And I think what happened was, people saw their brand, saw how cool we were at the time, saw all the kind of hype things we were doing and just wanted to join that, but they expected to join that with the growth and the opportunities and have calm, steady state, stable yeah. ways of doing business, which if you're growing at 100% year and year and year, you simply don't have. So you put people into this environment. Some people love it. Some people thrive in that environment and some people just don't. 
and the people who didn't decided to weaponize that and turn out against us. To... It's good advice though for fast growth startups. Manage is like manage expectations. Yeah, set, set the tone. Yeah. So what Zappos did, and again, I would just steal this and use it. So if I was like next time I'm building a company of scale, when people join, it's like we are going through a scale period at the moment. This is what we do. This is how we do things. And Zappos do this as well. Like they offer people at the end of their induction five thousand dollars to quit. Like this might mm. not be the journey. This might not be the place for you. If you decide that amazing, no hard feelings. Here's five thousand dollars to take up for your time. Find an amazing opportunity, and we'll wish you all the best. And for me, the thing that we could have done better was just manage expectations of people joining us mm. during that high growth period. I mean, it's so fascinating because I again, you know, BBC did that documentary on mm. you, and I'm really personally pleased mm. that you sued them for it um can you tell us that? about that yeah what was that process oh, I mean, like? I mean, there's, there's been so many court cases so again i haven't spoken about it too much and i can tell the full story at some point when when i'm ready but at that time i when you're legally allowed to well, no i'm legally allowed to now but i just <laughs> call the time of the world, mate. <laughs> no. open a new brew dog yeah okay. give us the short version <laughs> yeah what's the you, TLDR? You, you, you you need a hell of a lot of time so want to know what kills big deals faster than anything security compliance honestly it's a headache and i don't know anyone who likes doing it but there is a solution, one that makes security compliance easy, Vanta. Think of Vanta as your compliance wizard. They automate everything for SOC 2 and ISO 27001, turning complex security requirements into a simple, streamlined process. Over 8,000 companies, from startups to giants, trust Vanta to handle their compliance. Use Vanta so you don't get slowed down by security paperwork and focus on what matters, growing your business. Visit vanta.com forward slash secret leaders now and get $1,000 off your first year. At the time when we were being kind of <laughs> turned to pieces by the media, um, I was undergoing some things personally that were like the toughest things that I'd ever underwent. And I ended up winning a court case in the highest court of, of Scotland, the court of session, a landmark court case. And I was awarded £750,000 worth of damages. So essentially not going to tell the full story which is like a crazy movie plot and netflix actually want to make a documentary out of it but i'm not ready for that yet either <laughs> but essentially it was people that kind of used to be close to me that weren't anymore that set up fake anonymous withdrawal accounts that looked like actual real people on social media and was sending hundreds of messages a day to every single one of my hundreds of thousand followers with all these kind of crazy claims about me and then at the same time wow. that same person and I didn't know this at the time, got in touch with me and told me, hey, I've just received all these messages from you. I can help you shut this down, but only if you pay me. So there's all this kind of fraud and corruption and, and, and craziness in the mix. So I was like fighting like a media storm in one front and, and, and all that another front as well. And just so grateful to won the court case and kind of put that one to put that one to bed. But that was uh, that was tough too. Bloody hell. And all these things you just did, like, I just want to build a fantastic beer business. I don't want like Bitcoin fraud, impersonation, all this chaos. I think that's the thing that gets lost yeah. in this that I think is really important mm. for people to hear, which mm. is that, like, again, you just want to build a great business. Yeah. And, like, the rest of it, just fuck yeah. off. Yeah. Just give you the space to build yeah. that business, admit your mistakes, all that kind of stuff. But this is yeah. absurd. Want to create jobs, want to pay taxes, want to contribute to the economy, want to create a business that manufactures in the UK and exports. And like so much of our business is overseas and like the UK economy is struggling at the moment. What does the UK need? First, like economic growth. But even more important than that, because you don't want displacement, is companies in the UK that make things in the UK, that employ people in the UK and send those things overseas. And that's what we've done so much as a business. Mm. So BrewDog is now valued at uh, two billion. Well, who, who knows in current markets, but at, at peak we've been up about that level. So. Yeah. So at what point did you become, I suppose, the establishment that you once were <laughs> rebelling against? And, and that's one one of the things that's been so difficult on this journey. Is... Are you going to make a pop music uh, beer? Maybe no. Punk? Oh, okay. Punk, pop. pop. Yeah. Oh, I might, go in, popular, might, might go indie. You're the popular <laughs> brand now, so... <laughs> well, so a, a, a few things to unpack in that. So the brand has always been far bigger than the business. And we've always loved playing the underdog card. And one of the things that was so difficult in the journey was that point where we couldn't play the underdog card anymore. And like mm. people are more emotional than logical. So you can't argue people with logic. It makes no sense and it doesn't work at all. But like 
our big competitor was still a hundred like hundred times bigger than us, we'd play underdog card and everyone would be like, What the fuck are you doing playing the underdog card? You guys are massive. And you can't say, Well, no, our brand perception is massive, but our sales are so that kind of evolution out of that was quite difficult. And like that challenge of we're now a bigger company, we've got to do things in a slightly different way, but we've got to keep that edge, that energy, that ethos. And it's, I think it's something like all companies that kind of start out as kind of underdogs or kind of challengers, like fighting against when you start becoming even a tiny bit like the establishment, like what, like what, like what? It's it's like been such a challenge for us. And we've got investors and we're a semi-public company because we've got loads and loads of equity punks. And again, I think if there's like things that I haven't managed as well as I could have in the journey, if I'm being reflective, it's A, how I manage things when the kind of cash came in from the private equity company. B, it's I didn't manage people's expectations in joining the company as to what it is to work for a company that's grown 100% year on year on year. And C, that I didn't fight hard enough to avoid us even becoming one or two percent establishment when some of these things inevitably happen when you scale a company and become successful. Yeah, because I think a really interesting thing, obviously building a consumer company at the moment and far away from it being household or anything like that. But I really relate, obviously, we, when we launched, it was all yeah. about challenger brand dynamics and all the books you read are about how to build yeah. a challenger brand. Um, and at some point, you know, Apple's a great example. You know, their whole yeah. entire raison d'etre was challenger brand to Microsoft. They overtake Microsoft and become the de facto and they have to really change tack. And I guess I'm really curious how how you or your marketing team have adapted when so much of the heart and soul of your business is that concept like have you found a way to completely reposition the brand to mainstream culture or are you still in search of it i think we're still in search of that but i mean if we take take a step back like what is our foundation what's our mission and our mission has been the same since day one our mission is to make other people as passionate about fantastic beers we are we want to put amazing beers into people's glasses and we want to live and die by what's in every single glass what's in every single can and just like hang our hat an amazing quality beer so for us how we gauge success is how many people are enjoying fantastic beers as opposed to beers which are not good and beers is this amazing thing it takes people together so scale is like a double-edged sword it means we can't be perhaps as provocative perhaps as much on the edge as we have been at various points in the growth journey but always from day one success was getting our beard into more and more people's hands so at the moment and it's amazing to see the cannon lines going up in ellen but in ellen we make and sell about a million cans of beer a day so to see the kind of big cannon line going at seventy thousand cans is, is amazing so it's an honor and a privilege to be able to get that much beer into people's hands but it does mean that certain things that we've done and certain things that have been so important in our playbook you just can't do anymore with that scale and I think while staying true to our mission of getting people to be as passionate about fantastic beer as we can, I think it's fair to say that we've struggled a little bit with having some of those tools, those weapons taken away from us mm. because you can't play those when you're the skill that we are at the moment. What brand do you look at now that you're like, I'd go work there? Or at least I'd be on their board because they're just so <laughs> exciting. Uh, I think it's the best brand there is in the UK at the moment. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's a cutting edge supplement business called Heights. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a massive fan. I'd love to be on their board. <laughs> okay, fair play. Yeah. Yeah. It's What's another $2,000 to my <laughs> holiday budget. <laughs> they can't pay pounds. Yeah. I, 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 don't get, I don't get paid to be on the show, but I feel like I'm part of an ad. Yeah. You should um, be paid in magnesium. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's, that's true. true. Um, so you've, you've, you've gone no, from... Hold on, hold, on, hold yeah. on. I do genuinely want to know the answer to that question, though. Like, is there an actually... Um, is there a big brand? Like, you know, is there a big brand that you think... Okay, I'll put it differently. Okay. You, you, at, at BrewDog, you do have this uh, challenge. Yeah. Um, there are brands that do this super well. There are brands with the greatest advertising in the world as global brands. So there are still brands that you could really learn from. And I know you're not yeah. like full-time CEO, etc. Yeah. But it, are there one or two that you're like, yeah, I absolutely love those brands, even though they're really big and I've got a lot to learn from them and I would love to go and soak up their energy and, and how they come up with stuff? So, so great question. Because we've got that challenge state, I mean, it's not an insurmountable challenge. And like every journey, there's challenges to unlock the next level and you can't unlock it the same way you did the previous level. So we're facing a challenge with Dog at the moment. Like we will find a way to unlock it in terms of our position, our comms, how we engage with our community. And that could unlock this kind of crazy level for us. So it's definitely not insurmountable. In terms of other companies at the moment, I mean, I just love anyone who is like willing to take a risk. So for me, ambition is always proportional to risk. So if you're trying to do something incredibly ambitious, that comes with a huge amount of risk. 
but then also kind of growth is proportional to risk as well. So unless you're willing to take a massive risk, unless you're willing to put everything on the line for what you believe in, you're not really opening yourself up to achieve real success and you're not opening yourself up to kind of, like we saw the kind of building with dog as like a game. Like we've got to get to the next level. We get to that next level by taking a risk. We're at now level four. Mm. How do we get to level five? There's a risk. So just any company that's like willing to take a list, risk and are so passionate about what they do, they're willing to kind of gamble to grow the business. Their mission is that compelling. I'm super supportive of. So you've obviously gone in your life so far from like a total upstart to massive business. And now you've stepped back. Yeah. When you look at the sectors and the businesses out there right now, what are the things that are interesting you? What are the spaces you're looking at and thinking someone could build a, a brew dog in this space? Great question. And for me, I think any space is open to it. So I'm almost kind of space agnostic. What I'm looking for when I invest, it's a couple of things. So one, it's it's people, it's tenacity and resilience, which I think is by far the most important quality for any entrepreneur because you're going to get kicks, you're going to get knockbacks, you're going to get setbacks, how you respond to them determines your destiny. And secondly, from a brand perspective, and like not enough people speak about it, not enough people like focus on it, it's, it's community. It's like forget advertising, forget design, forget engagement forget cost per click forget all of that like community how engage your community and how can you find ways to engage your community that your competitors can't and if i tick those boxes regardless of the sector i'm excited about that business interesting and is that is there like a any sector you've got your eye on because obviously we've got so much going on at the moment you know like ai has quite literally changed everything if you're starting a new business now that probably plays into it like are there sectors you're thinking yeah, I could, could oh, look at that. There's one sector I'm specifically excited about, which is why I've started my own business in that sector as opposed to invested in it. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, tell yeah. me a bit more about <laughs> Social Tip. Um, so we wanted to build the ultimate tool to help heights be a success in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> we're a customer. Yeah, I know, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I told you, the Ponzi works. He, <laughs> yeah. he buys heights, I then buy social yeah. tip, the Ponzi just never ends. I, my backpack is like overflowing with magnesium. Are you just not taking it? <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's not the pitch you think it is. <laughs> yeah, my, my house yeah. is full Can't of heights. It's fucking it. annoying. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it does anything. It's drawers full of this shit. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm so glad to be your backpack filler. <laughs> yeah, so my new business is called Social Tip. And it is kind of based on everything I've learned about marketing, about the customer, about engagement over the last decade. And it's also kind of based on where I see marketing going. So Social Tip essentially is on a mission to democratize influence and it helps companies turn their customers and their employees into their influencers. And for us, by far the most important people are customers and employees and their best place to sell the story, tell the mission, sell the dream, explain the passion, showcase the product, far better place than advertising or influencers, which are just kind of bouncing off people. And our whole sales pitch is, rather than give someone like my amazing fiance, sorry again, Georgia, five or 10,000 pounds to do one post on social media, we think companies are better off giving some of that budget, giving 5,000 pounds to 500 of their customers. So give 500 of your customers 10 pounds each to post. It's going to be more authentic. It's going to be more trustworthy. You're putting money back into the pocket, the most important people in your universe, your customers, and it's going to resonate way more with the people who follow them because it's real as opposed to fake in their actual customers. And then again, with employees, if you put money in your employees' pockets to post, they love your brand, they're working, they've got an amazing perspective on what you do. So that is Social Tip. We're launching in about six weeks, six weeks time, and we're going to try and build an amazing business that helps the best companies win and puts money back into the pockets of people in the UK and beyond. What's your biggest um, obstacle there? I'm sure you hear the same old challenges. Mm. I, I went to obviously um like a drinks thing at yours and you're talking about some yeah. of the the objections that kept coming up were all the yeah. same ones right yeah. uh who wants 10 quid like it's pointless it's well, not enough etc et et i'm just saying that yeah, the, yeah. that was the nature of yeah. the most common yeah. objection that i heard around yeah. the table that night um so what do you actually think are going to be the biggest objections and biggest challenges so in terms of who wants 10 quid look at what people do on depop and vinted to get five six seven pounds let alone 10 pounds i think there's more than enough people and like social tip targeted towards maybe students people at kind of earlier stages in their career but i think so many people want 10 quid 20 quid maybe even 25 pounds for an amazing post 
And the business has got two challenges. We need to get fantastic partner brands signed up and we need to get users on the platform. And we haven't launched yet and we've got 250 amazing partner brands signed up. So we've just signed Tala, we've signed up ASOS, we've signed up Knoops. And um, we're in like some discussions with some amazing kind of global businesses as well. And I think every business sees the value in user generated content. We help them skill user generated content, which is an amazing tool to grow your business. So this is essentially word of mouth marketing, which is how people discover about new things, but scaled for the digital age and mm. easily amplified as well. But the challenge is, and like, hey, every business is incredibly difficult. And do I think we can build something remarkable here? Yes, which is why I'm dedicating so much of my time and energy and money to it. Is it going to be even more difficult than the first journey? Yes, but by, by default it's going to be, but I think it's got so much potential and I love the mission of helping businesses win that have got a high amount of consumer love because those tend to be the best businesses and helping put money back into people's pockets. So I've, I've, I've done a lot, a lot of work, like I did uh, I don't know, 12 years working with brands and influencers yep. um, and obviously spent a few years doing health technology for five years or something. And then now I would say in the last year, I've probably got like, I don't know, one plus billion views on my content. So I do a hell of a lot of work with brands and influencers yeah. and so forth. Are you talking about the ability for a brand to say, I will put X budget and then the system would say, here is 500 people that could for X price yeah. and X outcome interact in the way that you want? No, but close. So the brand would put some money on our platform, be it 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 pounds, their community and we verify the purchase. So someone would have to have bought the clothes from ASOS.com. Somebody would have to have bought the glasses from Spectacle, uh, from Specsavers. Somebody would have to have bought the Peloton from Peloton. We verify that purchase. Your community then post, we assign a value to that post based on reach, likes, engagement, and quality. They then get paid five, 10, 15, 20 pounds from the brand for creating that bit of UGC. So very, very similar. And the idea is like, empower your customers, engage your community. Like mm. these are the people that are passionate enough to spend their own hard earned money on the thing that you do, but it also democratizes influence. So if you've got 500 followers in a private account, you can earn money with social tip. If you've got a thousand followers, and when I was a kid, everyone wanted to be a football player, a movie star, a pop star, a politician, whatever. Like now everyone wants to be an influencer. So it lets that next generation emulate their heroes by earning money when they post about the things they love. Online yeah, as well. I mean, we had an amazing conversation earlier today about creators and influencers, and it's actually really, I think it's a hell of a lot harder for new influencers and creators to actually make reliable money. And so this sounds like a great tool to... Yeah, yeah exactly. So kind of lower level influencers and creators can absolutely use social tip as well. And it's I think... also like they naturally might be doing it anyway. Mm. To, 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 yeah, to yeah. your point, so using the heights perspective, to your point, our customers do it anyway. Yeah. So yeah. you might as well reward them for it Would because you? we will use those images and we will use those reviews and we'll use them in our advertising. Yeah. And for 10, 15 quid per person, yeah. 25, whatever, they've done it anyway. They're only going to feel the net benefit is only positive. You yeah. were either going to yeah. give them zero and they did it for free anyway, or you're going to give them some cash and say thank you, which is going to drive more engagement and love for you for doing that on top of it. Because there yeah. was no quid pro quo. They did it anyway. How are you? Uh, how are you funding this company? So I have funded it myself, but I've also taken on some absolutely fantastic investors. And I'm so fortunate that we had so much demand from investors for the concept. So I've been able to be quite selective and we've only taken on like some of the best tech investors on the planet. So we've got Rob Small, who founded Miniclip, a unicorn four times over. We've got Chris Vander Kyle, who is the guy behind Minecraft, the most successful video game of all cool. time. Ryan Peterson, who was at Finger Food and, and Unity. Um, Nick, who was behind Design My Night. So we've got some amazing tech Tell entrepreneurs. Them. Yeah, Nick tells us. Like, yeah, I was with him this morning. Really? I yeah, love him I was with him this morning. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So we've got such amazing investors. Like, I feel so lucky and privileged to have them. And this is my first tech business. And that's been something that's difficult for me. Because like, if this was hospitality, if this was manufacturing, I know the productivity metrics. I know the labor percentage is a proportion of sales. Like, I know what to manage and I know how to manage those people. Like tech, I feel a little bit blind and helpless, which is which has been tough, which has been tough for me. So um, having those guys, those people as part of the team, mm. amazing way to help get me up to speed with how to run a tech business versus a consumer goods business. What's your personal strategy then for the rest of your career? Do you want to do portfolio entrepreneurship? Um, have a few of these, so you put your money in, 
you've hired a team. Presumably, you're not CEO. I don't know. Also, I'm CEO. You are CEO. Yeah, I'm CEO. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, but do, do you want to be CEO for like the next ten years or whatever, yeah. or do you want to get my exit strategy is to die in the seat? Yeah. Yeah. Is I, it really? I, I want to build something amazing. And okay, so you don't want to do multiple. You don't want like social tip and then the next one as well, and then I, I think I can maximum do two at a time as CEO. So social tip is taking up a huge amount of time. With at the moment and I'm so passionate about the business I might start something else in the next 12 months but I, I can't do more than two so a couple of businesses that I'm managing myself and then being as hands-on as I can with some of my investment kind of portfolio companies like like Talo Nash and like mm. a few of others as well incredible that's the, that's the plan and we'll see we'll see how we go and hey if it all blows up I love business I love working with founders I love trying to disrupt so I'm going to have the most amazing journey and if none of it works like I would be delighted to be back in a lobster fishing boat <laughs> I'll take that yeah, I mean, with 50 million, you're not going to be ending up <laughs> back there anytime yeah. soon, you know. Yeah, you can be buying the lobster. I think at this point, you're fine. <laughs> I mean, we'd get a decent lobster boat, but yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, the second, you know, the whole second act thing, it's a thing. Do you feel that? Oh, way more pressure second time around than first time around. Mm -hmm. Way more expectation, way more scrutiny. Like when we started, like nobody knew, nobody cared. You could do whatever you want and nobody would pay any attention. Mm -hmm. Whereas here with Social Tip, we're like a week late, everyone's like, what the hell? So, like the stakes are high. I don't mind that because I think like high stakes like sharpens you, focuses you, and I'm like so committed to it. I think the opportunity is is fantastic, and I think the mission is really cool as well. So let's see what we can do and see if we can add to the the first success. And Amazing. if not, let's mm -hmm. put everything in line for something we believe in and just work as hard as we can and see where we go. Awesome, James. Amazing. Massive thank you for joining us today on Secret Leaders. I absolutely love the conversation. Thanks. How would you rate the podcast one to ten? It's, it's low. Uh, three. Uh, <laughs> three I'll, I'll take anything over one. 